Dr. Jill Kalesser, thank you so much for being with us. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Renee. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Yes. There's been a dramatic change in the practice of cancer treatment, that it's not just radiation, it's not just chemotherapy anymore. Talk us through the new opportunities and options that are available. Well, what we've learned in cancer over the last 25 years or so is that cancer is actually caused by mutations. And those mutations are usually one of two types. They're either oncogenes or tumor suppressor genes. And tumor suppressor genes are kind of like the brakes of your car. So if you can imagine if your brakes go out, mm -hmm. your car goes out of control. So what tumor suppressor genes, when they get a mutation in them, the cell goes out of control. And oncogenes are more like the gas pedal. And imagine your gas pedal just being stuck down to the, to the floor. Um, then again, your car goes out of control. And so with oncogenes, you get a mutation in that oncogene and the cell goes out of control. And imagine if you had both those problems, right. <laughs> no brakes and your, and your pedal to the metal. And that's actually what happens in a cancer cell is that there's a combination of mutations in brake genes and in gas genes uh, that cause the cell to go out of control and that's what causes the cancer. And so we've learned that over the last 25 years and the major advance that we've made really is that um, we've identified drugs that work on those specific, specific mutations in those genes. And the great thing about those drugs is that they only target the genes in the cancer cells that are mutated. So they work better and they have less adverse effects. And they don't attack the other healthy genes. Right. Exactly. We hear the term precision medicine. So in layman's terms, tell us, tell us what that means. Well, it's basically finding out which brake and gas genes are mutated in a patient. You take a piece of their tumor and you take, send it to the lab and you get a report back that tells you this gene is mutated, that gene is mutated. And once we have that information, the next thing we can do is see if there's a drug that that patient might be eligible for. And so there are several terms here that I'll have you define to help us understand targeted therapy. What is that and how does it work? So the targeted therapies are, are drugs that are usually oral medications. And again, they only work on the break genes and the gas genes. Mm -hmm. So they, they go specifically to the cancer, they go specifically to those genes. And that's, what, um, and that's why they have that good activity. And immunotherapy? So immunotherapy is a little bit different, but that's also another major advance. So when I was talking about the gas and the break genes, so when you have those mutations, they make an abnormal protein. And so the job of the immune system is actually to find those abnormal proteins and get rid of those cells before they can develop into a cancer. But uh, the cancers are actually kind of sneaky Mm -hmm. And they have something that is very, it's kind of like Harry Potter's invisibility cloak, or the Romulans had that technology in Star Trek, the cloaking device. Mm -hmm. And so the cancers will kind of put this cloaking device around them and hide from the immune system. And what immunotherapy does is it comes and it just pulls off that cloaking device. And then the immune system can see the cancer and then the immune system actually eliminates the cancer cells. So the, the immune system is doing some work there. Yeah, the immune system is doing most of the work. Mm -hmm. So not all therapies uh, work with all cancers and so some are effective for lung cancers and others are not. Tell us about this. Well, I think, you know, it kind of depends on the type of cancer you have. Um, Non-small cell lung cancer is the most common cancer and um, non-small cell lung cancer has a lot of these different gas and brake mm -hmm. mu gene mutations as well as cloaking devices. And so um, fortunately about 75% of patients with non-small cell lung cancer have one of these problems and can get a targeted therapy or an immunotherapy. So those seem to be effective options for, for them. Uh, how is precision medicine changing the prognosis for people with lung cancer and certain types of lung cancers? So the 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 deaths due to cancer has declined about 5% over the last eight years. Um, and about one or 2% of that decline is related to less people smoking and less people getting, getting the lung cancer. But the other two to 3% is actually due to better drugs that we have for patients. And I think we're really kind of only at the beginning of this because mm -hmm. we haven't had these drugs for very long. Right. We know that not everyone who gets lung cancer has a history of smoking. Uh, and so tell us about how that may be surprising 
for some to hear that there are non-smokers or those who are former smokers who come down with lung cancer. Yeah, that's one of the things that we are seeing a lot more of. Actually, as less people smoke, um, we're actually seeing an increase in lung cancer in people who are, who are never smokers. Um, we don't exactly know what has caused their, their lung cancer, but some of the things that can are asbestos and radon. Um, so they could potentially have had an exposure to that, or they could have been potentially exposed to something we don't know about. But those people are actually even more likely to have a mutation in one of these gas and brake genes. And talk about secondhand smoke. How do you classify them? They may not have smoked themselves, but they had that secondhand exposure. Where do they fall into either uh, a smoker or non-smoker experience there? So we generally classify them as non-smokers, if, even if they've been exposed to secondhand smoke. Um, and there certainly is a risk of secondhand smoke, but um, it's not as high as if you are the actual smoker. Right. Uh, let's talk about uh, people who are diagnosed with, with lung cancer and what they can do to find out what their next steps should be. Requesting tumor gene sequencing. So tell us what that means and why could that make a difference in the project trajectory of one's treatment course? Yeah, so when, when somebody is diagnosed with cancer, they first have to have a biopsy to confirm what type of cell it is and what the origin is. Then the next thing that they have to do is have a scan to kind of see how far that the cancer has spread. And then, then we take the biopsy that is obtained from, or the, the tissue sample that's obtained from the biopsy and we send it to the lab to go ahead and do that sequencing. Mm -hmm. um, and what the sequencing does is it tells us, you know, how many mutations are in oncogenes or gas genes and how many are in tumor suppressor genes. And then once we have that report, that's what we can use to identify a therapy that might be effective for that patient. Are there different types of lung cancers and, and what are they and how do they respond similarly or different to therapies? Yeah, the most common is non-small cell lung cancer and the second most common is small cell. Um, and by and large, the non-small cell lung cancer has, it's much more common to have these mutations and cloaking devices. And is that typical of smokers or non-smokers or what do we know about which population is affected? Um, well, kind of, it's kind of a mix um, because almost all patients will have with non-small cell lung cancer will have mutations in these genes. Mm -hmm. Although certain mutations are more common in people who are non-smokers, like EGFR, and which means epidermal growth factor receptor. Uh huh. And and so, uh, any further explanation you care to make on on that particular term? Um, well. It, that's, that's actually one of those gas genes mm -hmm. instead, of a, instead of a break gene. And we have at least five different drugs that can target that particular gene and mutation. So that was one of the first ones that were discovered in lung cancer. This is something that many people may not know about. It's the Molecular Tumor Board. Uh, you started this in Wisconsin and the University of Kentucky grabbed you and recruited you to start this type of program here. What is it and how does it work? So the Molecular Tumor Board is an interprofessional group of, of people. So there's doctors, there's pharmacists, there's genetic counselors. And um, remember I was saying when, when we send the tumor off for sequencing, it comes back with a report. And so this report can be 50 pages long. Patients can have 15, 20, 30 different mutations with you know, four or five different drug options for every mutation. Mm -hmm. And so this team can get together and look over this report um, and, and, the case, and, and the patient history and try to help identify the, the best treatment for an, an individual patient. Right. Is this widely accessible or widely used tool? They're pretty new, actually. Um, so you see them in academic medical centers. Um, I think they've been in academic medical centers for about the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. Kentucky started four years ago. Um, and one of the things that we did in Kentucky is we made it accessible to every community medical oncologist in Kentucky um, because they probably don't have the resources in a smaller community practice to put this on. And so that's why we thought as a, as a designated cancer center that it was really important for us to offer this to the state. And are these oncologists latching on to this idea and concept? We have a lot of, we ha I think more than 30 different uh, community oncology practices will send cases to us. 
So uh, we've had really good uptake from the community and, and but still have plenty of room for more if anybody needs it, wants to join. Mm -hmm. Tell us what motivated you to start this. Well, one of the things one of the things we know about is that you know we discover we discover things they get implemented in academic medical centers they get put into guidelines but it takes a long time to trickle out into the smaller practices and one of the things i, I in my early career what i did is i studied these these genes and tr tried to use them to you know identify mm -hmm. um, different therapies and so in in my career I, I'm really fortunate to have gone from a research idea to something that actually is beneficial to people and so it was very disturbing to me <laughs> that in mm -hmm. small communities uh, this wasn't available to everybody and so so that's what motivated mm -hmm. us to start the molecular tumor board and in a state like Kentucky, which is majority rural, how can this really be an asset? Well, even before COVID, we held it by teleconference. So we would meet in person, but we offered it as a teleconference to, to the community medical oncologists. So we wanted to make it as accessible as we could. Yeah, regardless of geographic barriers and other things. Uh, how do you work? You talked a little bit about this, but how do you work with community oncology practices? So any community uh, oncology practice can send us a case. Um, they can send it by fax. They can put it through the web portal. And then we have a coordinator who works to um, schedule the meetings and get everything organized. And she'll put it on the meeting agenda. And then we'll look at it in advance. And then at the time of the meeting, the patient's doctor will call in and talk about the details about the case. You know. You know, if they want, if they're interested in a clinical trial, you know, how their renal function is, you know, you know what, what they're kind of interested in knowing. So things that we need to be able to make a good recommendation. And then our team will have reviewed the mutations and we'll have reviewed, you know, the clinical trials that are available and, and, the, and the other drugs that are potentially available as well. Mm -hmm. And so we'll have a discussion at that meeting um, to determine amongst the group uh, what, what would be the best course of therapy. And then at the end, we write up a letter um, to the treating doctor and send it out to him. Mm -hmm. Can you recall a time when um, you had some pretty devastating news that you needed to deliver? Um, perhaps that happens more often than you'd care for it to happen. Um, can you talk about those experiences when perhaps there doesn't seem to be a viable option? Yeah, so unfortunately, I'd say about 25% of the time, we're not able to identify any uh, therapeutic options for the patients. And everybody, it's, it's always the, the, everybody is always sad, frustrated, sad, wish we had something better to offer. But I think what that really does is it spurs our motivation to find additional clinical trials and to work with companies and under other individuals to develop more drugs. Mm -hmm. To hear that a quarter, 25%, sounds like a high percentage. Is that just because I'm a layman? <laughs> uh, or is that seeming to be a really high number that needs to be worked on? Well, I think one thing we should think about is, you know, 10 years ago, it was zero. Mm. Everybody got standard chemotherapy. So I think that we've made pretty significant strides right. in identifying therapies for 75% for, for of patients with lung cancer that that are targeted yeah. or immunotherapy. And along those lines about the data on the effectiveness of the molecular tumor board, can you share more about the successes? Yeah, so we just did an analysis of our molecular tumor board to, and we focused it solely on lung cancer, non-small cell lung cancer. And what we're able to show is that patients who received a review from the molecular tumor board had improved overall survival compared to patients um, diagnosed in Kentucky with the same stage of disease that did not have the molecular tumor board review. And the other thing that we think is really important about this is we looked if, did it matter if the patient was treated in the community or in an academic medical center? And it did not. So as long as they received the molecular tumor board review, they did just as well as the patients in the academic medical centers. So this has been a missing link for some time before you came aboard from Wisconsin to University of Kentucky. Uh, <laughs> I don't, I, I, I really, I, I'm really gratified just to, in any small way to be able to, the reason that we all got into cancer research was to help people. Mm -hmm. And I'm really gratified. That's why I go to work every day to just be able to help 
people just even in a small way. Yeah. If you had one message that you wanted to share with the general public in terms of lung cancer treatment, what would it be? I think it's really important to understand the strides that we've made because I think a lot of people are afraid to even get the treatment because they've heard horror stories about chemotherapy. And right now, 75% of people are gonna be candid candidates for a targeted therapy or an immunotherapy. And those drugs are really making big differences for people, improving their survival. Um, and they also have less adverse effects and they improve your quality of life. So I would say if you're diagnosed with lung cancer, there is a lot of hope and there's a lot of options that, that have just become recently available. The other thing, um, there's many, many clinical trials and those are also you know, an exceptional opportunity for patients to get the newest therapies that are available. At the Markey Cancer Center, we're the only NCI-designated cancer center in Kentucky, and we have access to early phase clinical trials that are only available at Markey. Mm -hmm. And so uh, those are available, and, and we've seen some good responses with those trials as well. So main thing, just do, do not give up on, on it. Just, just mm -hmm. tr explore some treatment options. For those who may be hesitant about trying experimental therapies and treatments, uh, clinical trials, what would be your message to them if they are, if that seems like a viable route for them? I think they should discuss it with their with their doctor, um, and their doctor can give them advice on whether they think he, wh wh whether he or she feels like this is a good treatment option for them. Um, and I can also say that clinical trials that are coming into the Markey Cancer Center have been vetted at the National Cancer Institute. Mm -hmm. So uh, their design, you know, we can't guarantee that they're going to be effective. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a clinical trial. But, but they've been designed and vetted by the biggest experts in the field to, to offer people the best possible opportunity that, that we can give them. Can you tell us how you became interested in cancer research at the very beginning? Well, I actually grew up in a pretty small rural community myself and didn't have access to guidance counselors. And so uh, I went to college and I had never heard of cancer or cancer research or anything like that. And uh, I was a second year student and I saw a TV program on NOVA about tumor infiltrating lymphocytes or TILs. And I, I was just fascinated, and that was the day I decided I wanted to become a cancer researcher. So you decided that day upon that episode that you had found your life's passion. I did, and I, I didn't even take till the end of the program. <laughs> wow. Well, that's interesting. So, yeah, how many minutes in does it take to convince someone to change maybe their, their passion or their course in life? Yeah, this has got to be 30 years ago, and I still remember almost every minute of that show. I, I think it's probably about 10 minutes in. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's amazing. That's amazing. What an experience. Well, the power of public television, <laughs> right? And that's what that speaks to. Or that the passion was already there. You just needed an exposure. Uh, sometimes the message is just being exposed to something uh, to trigger a curiosity. So we know that there are times when you have disappointing news that you need to relay, but I'm sure there are some success stories that stand out to you and remind you of why you are doing this work so valiantly. Well, one really comes to mind because it truly was an interdisciplinary team approach to this patient. So this was a young woman uh, who was diagnosed with a very severe cancer. Uh, first two months she was in and out of the hospital because it was it was so severe. Um, she had actually been on a make-a-wish trip and um, her treating doctor decided to order next generation sequencing to, to find out if they had any gas or break genes and it turned out she had one. And it turned out that there was a drug for it. And um, so she went on that drug and uh, went from basically going deciding to go into hospice to Living, living, living her life just like no big deal anymore. And so into even the molecular tumor board contributed even just a small part to that. We, we, we're all just so, ha so grateful and thankful that we could, could have that Im Im impact. Oh, absolutely. And just one gene is all it took. One gene. Yeah, that's amazing, um, truly. I, I did want to ask you about the survival rates and long-term, I mean, when we talk about lung cancers and certain types, I mean, what does the prognosis look like? Well, it's getting better and better. 
Um, one of the problems that we have though is that um, you get started on a targeted therapy and it'll work for three, four, five years. Um, and then the, the cancer becomes resistant and you have to go on to the next line of therapy. And so for some genes, we have three or four or five drugs. So that's great. And for some genes, we've just recently identified drugs. So we just have the first, first drug. Mm -hmm. um, but I think prognosis is improving all the time. Um, and particular as we get newer agents and more agents.